All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ella and I work for Sussex Wildlife Trust. And I'm here today to take you on a virtual seashore safari to explore the beach and the rock pools um, and show you how amazing the coastline in Sussex really is. I'm going to play you a 20 minute ish video and then you can ask me some questions at the end. But first, I'm going to talk briefly about an exciting new project happening in Sussex called Wild Coast Sussex. So this project is led by us, the Sussex Wildlife Trust in partnership with the Marine Conservation Society, Sussex IFCA, Brighton Sea Life, and it's funded by the no National Lottery Heritage Fund. So this project is running all along the Sussex coast. Um, it's got the aim of inspiring local people to care about and take ownership of their local coastal environment. So one of the main aims of the project is to inspire behavior change um, so that people make better choices in their day-to-day -day lives for the marine environment. So there's many ways in which we're going to do this um, during the three years of the project. And one of them is running wild beach sessions for children at local primary schools. So Wild Beach aims to connect learners to the marine environment. It focuses on coast, the coast, encouraging care and responsibility for the natural world um, for beach habitat and marine cons conservation. And we do that through child-led play, managed risk-taking and uh, repeat engagement of kids coming back to the same beaches uh, for wild beach sessions. So now that I've uh, told you a little bit about Wild Coast Sussex, I'm now gonna take you on this virtual seashore safari. So hopefully this works. everyone, my name's Ella and I work for the Sussex Wildlife Trust. I'm down here at these rock pools today to take you all on a seashore safari to try, and to try and find all the amazing creatures that we can find along the Sussex coast and all around the UK. Um, we're really lucky here because this is a marine conservation zone and that means it's a protected area and it helps to keep the species and habitats here um, out of harm. So let's go and see what we can find. just come to this rock pool and turned over a rock and really excitingly I found a fish so it's a blenny hopefully you can see it on the camera it's just here so you can see it's very well camouflaged and his tail is sort of turned like that and he's got very big pectoral fins so those are the fins right at the front of their body and they use those to sort of perch on rocks and things often you will find them hiding inside rocks and I think that's probably what this one was doing was hiding inside some of these holes um, and they will actually lay their eggs in holes and guard them and the, the male actually guards their eggs which is interesting so he's being very still right now but you can see a little bit of movement and they can actually change their colour to match their surroundings to help them camouflage and hide from predators which is really cool. So I'm going to carefully put the rock back over now so that he can go back to hiding and obviously I'll be really careful because they've got very soft bodies. So I'm just going to very carefully place this rock back. There we go. That was cool. Let's keep going. So I've had a really good look around the rock pools now and I've got a nice collection of stuff here in some buckets. 
the first thing I'm going to show you is we found another Blenny. So we can get a little bit of a better picture of what they look like. So do you remember I said that they can actually change colour depending on uh, where they are at the time? And you can see this one is a much sort of paler colour than the one we found in the rock pool and that's because it's in this white bucket and it's changed colour to try and camouflage itself. So you can really get a good view of its big pectoral fins there. And you might have heard of gobies. So they're very similar looking fish. But the Blenny, you can tell, it has a continuous dorsal fin. Now that's the fin that is um, down its back. And the goby has two separate fins. And this is a common Blenny. And they are fairly common around here, but it is always an exciting find to find a fish. Another fish we found, and this is really exciting because we don't often find these. Um, so, they're related to seahorses. Now we do get seahorses here, we get two species, um, but they're very rare and it's not very common to find them. Now this is a pipe fish. So I've just given him some seaweed to hide in it. And it does look a lot like a thin blade of seaweed. So it's this animal here. And it's long and thin and coloured exactly like that seaweed. So like I said, it's a really good camouflage for them. I think they're really cute and it's just very exciting because we don't see them very often. So in here, I've got a sea urchin. Let's see if I can pick it up. So it does stick itself down. I don't really want to prise it off too much, but they are covered in these spines. Let me see if I can get it. There we go. So, I mean, they're sharp, but obviously not so sharp that it's hurting me right now. Um, but it's a really good protection for it. It's covered in all these spines. So it's, you know, really good protection against um, birds and other predators eating it. These are related to starfish and sea cucumbers. And as you can see, it likes to sort of collect different things and stick it to itself. Again, it's for camouflage to hide itself from predators. And its mouth is on the bottom. So it looks quite alien, as you can see. So it basically walks around on little tube feet, grazing algae off the rocks with its mouth underneath. And these are quite well stuck on. I'm not gonna take them off. So it's a pretty fascinating little creature. This big thing here that's stuck to it is a piddock shell. So normally it would have two, when it was alive, it had two shells and a hinge here. And these are often what makes this, the holes in the chalk rocks, particularly here in Sussex, we've got lots of nice chalk. Um, and they sort of dig themselves down into the chalk and then they end up living there for their whole lives. And you can imagine that's a really good place to live for them because it completely hides them away and um, protects them from predators. And sometimes, as you're walking over the rock pools, you'll see a spurt of water come out, and that will be a piddock spurting water. It's quite cool to see. I'm going to put this guy back now. We've got some more exciting animals on this rock. Let's see if I can find them. So, here we have an anemone. So, you might have heard of anemones from Finding Nemo because clownfish in tropical waters live in the tentacles of anemones. Obviously much bigger than this one, but this is an anemone. It's because it's out of the water now, its tentacles are all sort of flat and you can't really see them. But when it's in the water, it will extend them out and they have stinging cells 
in them, which they use to catch their prey, and their mouth is in the center of all those tentacles. And they can actually retract all of those tentacles inside, so you can just usually, when it's out of the water, see this sort of red blobby bit. This is a beadlet anemone, and they're quite common here. Then next to it, I don't know how well you can see, but this is a chitin. It's related to sea snails, so it's a mollusk, and it's got this sort of coat of arms shell with interlocking sections on it. And they live stuck to the rocks. They do move around, um, but also very well camouflaged. Like a lot of these rock pool creatures, they have very good camouflage to keep themselves hidden from predators. You know, and they have to camouflage themselves when they're exposed, when the tide is out, because things like birds will want to eat them. And then also when the tide is in and they're completely covered in water, they need to be well camouflaged too from predators in the sea. Put these guys back. Yeah. Got a couple of different crabs. Oh my, didn't realize how much in a bad shape this poor crab is. So this is a shore crab. I'm just gonna pick it up. So they're called green shore crabs often because often they're green. They don't, they're not always green. It can be a sort of reddy orangey color, but this one is a nice green color. And you can see normally they actually have eight legs and two pincers. So the pincers are actually a pair of legs, but they're sort of adapted. So essentially they should have 10 legs. But can you see this one has actually lost all four of its legs here, a leg there and its pincer. So it's been in a bit of a bad way, this one. Um, now it can actually grow those limbs back. It will take a bit of time, but it can do it. And you can see this crab is still very much alive and doing okay but must have got either got in a fight with another crab or maybe a bird picked it up and tried to eat it so with these crabs you can tell whether they're a female or a male by looking at this bit here so this is its tail flap and this is a female so you can see it's quite broad and sort of almost circular shaped here, whereas the male one will be much more kind of uh, triangular, angular. And this is where she will keep her eggs. So it's a flap and it extends like this and she will carry her kind of clutch of eggs around there for quite a few months before they hatch and there'll be hundreds and hundreds of them. And so she carries them around the whole time until they're ready to hatch so she can protect them so they don't get eaten. So hopefully this one will grow all its limbs back. So let's put her back in the bucket. We've got another little crab here. So let me see if I can pick it up gently. There we go. So this is called a broad clawed porcelain crab. So hopefully it's gonna kind of start walking around a little bit. Now this is very small and this is pretty much as big as they get. They're very small crabs. And they're called broad clawed because they've got extremely broad claws. So quite an obvious common name. And they're covered in uh, little hairs. They're very well camouflaged. They can cover themselves up in lots of sand and mud and dirt and stuff. You'll often find them on the underside of rocks. So if you pick up a rock, turn it over, there will often be lots of them on that bot uh, bottom side of the rock crawling around and they'll, if you turn the rock over, you know, they'll start crawling around to try and get away. Um, but I very gently pick this one up, and of course, I'm gonna put it back later. So you can see it, you know, it would camouflage very well in sand and next to rocks. So I'm gonna put this back now. We've got some shells as well. Oh, he's not coming off me now. <laughs> We've got some shells in here. So here we have a flat periwinkle. So we've got a couple of different species of periwinkles here. The other 
common one is called a common or edible periwinkle and they have a very pointed top and that's a very good way of telling the difference between the two because as you can see the top of this is very rounded and flat it doesn't stick up and it's a really nice color the, the common periwinkles are often sort of gray or black or dark brown and these pay, uh, sorry flat periwinkles can be very bright colors like this bright green and that will probably be because it's eaten uh, things like sea lettuce which is a nice bright green colour. We've also got a top shell here. So these are obviously all types of sea snails, mollusks. Just give this one up. So this is a top shell. Quite a nice pretty one and the little snail itself is just out of its shell. Sometimes you can see them moving around with its little antenna sticking out. Probably won't do it now that it's on my hand, but I'll put it back in the bucket and try and, if it starts to do it again, I will try and point it out. We also here have a dog whelk. You can see it's actually just peeking out there. Now the dog whelk is a predator and you can see here the opening of the shell, which is called the aperture. It has this groove right there, and that's where it sticks out its tooth. It's a sort of tooth called a radula, and it acts like a drill, and it will go around the rock pools until it finds things like limpets, which we've actually got a lot here. This is a limpet. and it will drill into the limpet shell and suck out its insides and eat it. So it takes a little bit of a long time and sometimes if you come to the rock pools, you might find a dog whelk sitting on top of a limpet. So don't pick it up and take it off because it might be in the middle of its dinner and you wouldn't really want to be interrupted eating your dinner by someone picking you up, would you? So yeah, always good idea to leave, to leave them where they are if you think that they're feeding or doing something else. So now I'm going to go and put all of these things back where I found them because um, that's always what you should do when you come rock pooling. If you ever pick anything up, put it in the bucket, always put it back where you found them. If your local beach doesn't have rock pools, then you can still find lots of really interesting things on the beach itself in what we call the strand line. And that's where the um, tide comes up to um, at high tide and dumps lots of materials onto the beach. So there's lots of different clues that you can find to which will tell you what you might find out in the sea. So I've gathered, gathered some here to have a look at. So. These are quite common here in Sussex. It depends where you are, um, whether they're a common sight or not. But these are um, known as mermaids' purses. And what they are actually are ray egg cases. So these dark ones come from skates or rays. So the adult rays will lay these out in the sea and the tiny baby will grow in here. It has like a yolk inside which gives the um, baby ray its uh, nutrients. And when it's big enough, it will break its way out of the case. Don't know if it's, you probably can't see that, but there, and swim out into the sea. So they sh lay them shallow so that they're nice and protected. Um, and then once they're bigger, they'll go out into the open ocean. So we've got a few of those. We get lots here on these beaches in Sussex. Um, we also get these ones, so these are actually shark egg cases. Um, you can see they're slightly different shape. They're a lot smaller, much thinner and lighter. And they have these very thin twirly tendrils which attach to the seaweed to stop it from uh, being washed out to sea. So these are from small spotted cat sharks. 
They used to be known as dogfish, now they're known as cat sharks. Um, and often you'll find them in clumps like this, a few together. Some other things that you can find. So this is a cuttle bone and it's quite kind of chalky. Maybe you've seen these before and not really known what it is. And it does come from a cuttlefish and it's sort of like an internal shell that they use for buoyancy to keep them floating in the right place in the water. And this is in the back part of them in the mantle here. And then they've got their tentacles and arms at the front. They look very alien-like. They've got a W-shaped pupil and they can, they're absolutely amazing creatures. They can change color and the texture of their skin in the blink of an eye to match their surroundings. It's absolutely amazing camouflage um, and they're fascinating to watch. They can also release ink into the water to confuse predators, to mask where they've been and to make a nice quick getaway. They're really fascinating. So that's what that is. You might come across some of these. It looks a bit like a, a sponge, um, but these are actually egg cases from um, whelks. So these are from a common whelk. Um, and if you look closely, if you find some, each of these little pouches would have a hole in where the tiny little snails have made their way out into the ocean. And interestingly, um, the first one to hatch will actually eat all the other whelks in there to get its energy to then be able to have a better chance of surviving out at sea. I mean, it's a bit grim, but that's life really <laughs> out in the ocean. It's a tough life and they need to give themselves a really good chance at the beginning. Um, we've got a few other shells as well. So this is actually comes from a whelk, a common whelk, which what would have laid these. Obviously, this is a little bit broken, but just to give you an idea, they can get to this sort of size. They can get quite big. Um, here in Sussex, we see quite a lot of these. These are um, slipper limpets, and they are an invasive species. So they were brought over here um, accidentally, um, and now they outcompete native oysters. So they like to grow in the same, live and grow in the same place as native oysters, and they're much just faster growing, and um, it's caused a decline in our native oysters, which isn't good. But we see loads and loads of these washed up on Sussex beaches and in other beaches around the UK. So sadly, as well as all these amazing natural finds on the beach, I'm sure you're aware that you can come across a lot of human-made items as well. And the most common thing you will find, unfortunately, is plastic. So I've got a little selection here. There's so much more on this beach sadly, um, but I've just got a little selection here. So plastic bottle of some kind, it's all been, the markings have been rubbed off. Uh, bottle tops, lots and lots of those. And also fishing line. So here's a bundle of fishing line. And this can be particularly dangerous for animals out in the ocean because they can just get tangled in it so easily. Um, and it's so, so strong, this stuff. It can last, I mean, most plastic items will last in the ocean for hundreds of years, maybe up to 500 years. And the thing with plastic is they never, it never really breaks down completely. It will just break into smaller and smaller pieces um, and animals can eat it, choke on it and die. Like I said, with the um, fishing wire and other fishing nets and ropes and stuff. Um, they can get tangled in it and die. It's called, it can be called ghost fishing gear when you get big clumps of old fishing net, um, which basically gets lost in the ocean and then continues to fish, just catching anything it comes by. Um, so it's really important that different projects around the UK are trying to remove ghost fishing gear, including a project here in Sussex called Wild Coast Sussex. Um, where we are trying to yeah, remove ghost fishing gear from the ocean and get it actually recycled because most of it is made of pla in plastic um, and we don't have good facilities at the moment to dispose of that and we're trying to make that better. Um, so yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. You can make do your part to help simply by coming to the beach and picking up 
a little bucket full or a bag full of plastic, taking it home and recycling it properly or just putting it in the bin by the beach. Um, obviously really important as well, if you come to the beach and you have a picnic, take away your plastic rubbish. You don't want to be adding any more plastic to what's already there. Um, so it's a really good rule, just when you come, always leave the beach cleaner than when you found it. Just make sure that when you are exploring the strand line, not to pick up anything sharp that might hurt you. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope it gives you a really good idea of what kind of things you can find while exploring the Sussex coastline. Um, so before we move on to um, taking some questions, I've got some actions that you guys can take to help the marine environment here in Eastbourne and beyond. So earlier this year, after months of work, an expert panel made a recommendation to the government to introduce highly protected marine areas to UK seas. So these areas would offer the strictest, highest possible um, protections for the marine environment, um, giving nature the best chance of recovery. So these areas would remove all pressures from them, including all types of fishing, construction, dredging, um, giving our shallow seas um, a chance to regenerate and become full of life and productive once again. So to help get these areas implemented, you can write to DEFRA, in support of them and the link to that should be in the event description. Um, so it'd be fantastic if we could all do that. The more numbers, the better. You can also pledge to always leave the beach cleaner than when you found it, as I spoke about in the video. It's a really simple action that everybody can take um, and it really does make a difference. And you can also become a member of Sussex Wildlife Trust. So we completely rely on our members to be able to carry on our work. So yeah, become a member and help us to protect uh, wildlife for years to come. Again, the link to that I think should be in the event description, I hope. So thank you very much for watching. And now I think we're gonna answer some of your questions. I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Nikki. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So Nikki is the Wild Coast Sussex project manager. Um, so she's here and we're going to answer some questions. Hi, Nikki. Hello. All right. Um, yeah, we've had lots of really interesting questions coming in already. So we've had one about um, invasive alien species and whether them washing out of uh, ballast tanks from tankers is causing any issues along the Sussex shoreline. Yeah, so as I mentioned in the video, the slipper limpet is a real problem in Sussex, particularly. Um, I'm sure you have all seen them on the beaches as you go for a walk. They're absolutely everywhere. And they were brought here in about 19, was it, was it the 1920s? In the 1920s. Yeah, from America, I believe. Um, and yeah, they just completely outcompete the native oyster for space, um, which just causes them massive problems really. Um, there's also a, a sea squirt called the carpet sea squirt that came over from Japan and so sea squirts sort of they look very alien. This one is mm -hmm. looks kind of just like a massive bits of slime almost. They're colonial, colonial animals and they just smother everything. That's what they do. You can find them on the hulls of boats. They cause damage that way and they can smother lots of different marine environments. Um, so yeah, sadly, there are a few issues with invasive species. Yeah, find a few of those washed up on the beaches here. They don't look very nice, um, but apparently they, they actually eat them over there. So um, never oh. did one myself. But, <laughs> um, we've had another uh, question. Um, can you do this all year round? Not that I feel like it today, or is this just a summer thing? Um, I assume you're referring to rock pooling and yes, you can do it all year round. Obviously, the weather is more favourable in summer, um, but yeah, rock pooling all year round. The best thing to do is to check the tide. So you want to be going on a falling tide. So as the tide is going out um, and most places, you'll need to be there around low tide to get it to the rock pools. Um, 
but if you go on a falling tide that means it's safe you're not being sort of approached by the water as you're rock pulling um and yeah just check the weather don't go if it's ridiculously windy as it can do here um but yeah winter rock pulling can be great it's a good thing to go out and do especially during lockdown yeah and another thing you can do if you can't go rock pulling is the you know the strand line survey at this time of year is really really good um just had some stormy weather over the weekends and if you wait till it's uh, a bit calmer um and then go out when the tide's going out and have a look at that strand line you get loads of interesting stuff washed up along there um so another question um we mentioned the beautiful fish in the talk that uses uh camouflage similar to the couple of fish are there other native species that do this any in sussex um, there's lots of different camouflage techniques, aren't there? Yeah. Probably the cleverest. Um, the spider crab, I quite like their technique where they, um, their sort of shell is covered in spines and then they use their long claws to pick up bits of seaweed and decorate their shell so that they can hide in among seaweed. So I think that's pretty cool. Maybe not quite as clever as the cuttlefish though. <laughs> yeah, the cuttlefish is master of disguise, I don't think. You can get better than that and the octopus as well which is obviously related to the purple fish um but they are absolutely incredible creatures aren't they um okay another question then um are you working with the natural history museum's seaweed survey yes we are um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've seen that as a really nice survey that you can use. They've got um, a little ID guide, um, uh, set sort of species. Um, we've used it with some school groups. We've gone out and done their survey and sending the results in to them. So um, yeah, I would recommend looking that up. It's a nice little survey to do. Okay, we've got a question here about seagulls. Um, so do seagulls eat the seashells or do they just love to be beside the sea like us? <laughs> well, seagulls are sort of scavengers, so they will eat pretty much anything they can find. And um, they do have very strong beaks, so they could crack through most uh, seashells that you find if there's something living inside it. Um, yeah, they'll go after crabs, they'll, eat anything in the strand line that they can um, and I'm sure you've noticed they'll go after human food as well. Um, obviously we encourage people not to feed seagulls because you know, it's not their fault, it's because people have fed them over time that they've become you know, obsessed with circling beachgoers as they eat their picnics, um, but it's much better for them to eat natural sources of food. I um, don't know if you want to add anything to that Nikki. Oh, just that our colleagues at Sussex Wildlife Trust would always say that seagull is a word, not a bird. And we should remember that there's lots of different species of gulls uh, along the Sussex coast. Um, and they are all wonderful in their different ways. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> OK, so we've got a question here about um, a wind farm. So would a wind farm on the Royal Sovereign Shoal be good or bad for wildlife? <sighs> That's a good question. Do you want to take that or do you want me to? <laughs> um, I mean... Wind farms are quite a contentious issue in some ways in that, yes, it's fantastic. We want more renewable energy, but the construction of them can often be quite uh, disruptive. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's lots of thoughts and different views out there about this. Um, yeah, what do you think? I don't really know enough about it yet, do we, to... Uh, yeah, not about that impact. Um, on on the wildlife, um, I can remember being able to hear when they were, you know, doing construction of the Rampion Wind Farm. I could hear the the noise underwater when I was um, swimming in the sea, um, and we did get reports that there were, you know, the fish were disturbed in the area. Um, but since then, we've had diver videos um, showing lots of life growing around the base of the wind farm, so it's acting as an artificial reef. So there's lots of different things to um, to weigh up and consider uh, with those ones. And um, we've got another good question here come in uh, about climate change, um, obviously really important at the moment. So are you seeing many changes to the shoreline types and dispersal of species with climate change? So there are sort of a number of different climate change indicator species. Um, 
such as, I can't remember exactly what species it is, but there's a species of barnacle um, that's very sort of um, particular, sensitive to temperature change. So it's a really good one to monitor um, if, you know, if it's moving its distribution, it's a really good indication that it's getting too warm for it in certain places. Um, and we do monitor that in our shore search survey. So this is our the Sussex Wildlife Trust and uh, the Wildlife Trust wide um, initiative. It's a citizen science project that anyone can get involved with. Obviously it's not happening at the moment, but hopefully once you know, COVID, <laughs> we can start doing these surveys again, then um, we will be out there monitoring um, these species. And obviously the, you know, distribution, species distribution changes have knock on effects to many different things. So, you know, if those barnacles can no longer survive here because it's too warm, um, then it will affect the, the things that prey on those barnacles, such as dog whelks that we spoke about in the video, um, and, you know, then it will affect their population numbers. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, just to say that if any, you know, if anyone watching wanted to get involved in Shore Search, then have a look at the Sussex Wildlife Trust website um, and you can see there how to sign up. As Ella said, we're not running surveys at the moment, um, but hopefully in spring we'll start up our survey season again. So, yeah. And if you sign up to the mailing list, then you'll get a notification of when they're starting again and how to how to sign up to the events. Great. And I've got a question for you, Ella. What's the yeah. Thing you've ever found in a rock pool or a Best thing I mean that has to be when um actually we you were there as well <laughs> um I thought you'd say that one yeah um so this was at Cow Gap in Eastbourne and we went uh rock pooling in the morning it was really early in the morning and we found some cuttlefish eggs so I don't know if um, you know what these look like. I know Nikki does, but it might be the audience. <laughs> so they're often called sea grapes because they look like grapes. They're very dark colour, black, and they're kind of sort of in a bunch. So we found them washed up on the shore. Um, and if we'd left them there, they would have dried out and died. We didn't know if there were any baby cuttlefish alive in there, but we picked them up and we put them in a bucket full of seawater. We left them for about, I don't know, it was about half an hour. 45 minutes maybe. Oh uh, yeah, long enough to go for a yeah. season. Yeah, we went for a swim, we came back and um, they had started to hatch and it was honestly the most exciting thing ever. We actually saw the baby cuttlefish emerging from their little egg cases and they look, they're just tiny miniature versions of adult cuttlefish. They're absolutely amazing. So I think six hatched and then we, yeah. um, put them in a, in a rock pool so that they will hopefully grow up into adult cuttlefish. And so we really hope, got absolutely no way of knowing whether those cuttlefish are still alive, but we really hope so, because um, it was absolutely, it was a magical moment. And during the sea swim, we also saw some seals as well, out in the distance, we weren't close, um, but that was really amazing. It was a really amazing morning. Yeah, that was very, very cool. I've also seen um, an adult cuttlefish um, in the rock pools around Eastbourne as well. So this was a couple of years ago on one of the shore search surveys. Um, yeah, we sort of turned over a rock and we're having a look around expecting to find some little crabs. And there was a full sort of adult uh, cuttlefish just swimming around in the rock pools and it just swam around our, our feet for ages, which was just absolutely magical. So it obviously sort of come in. Um, on the tide and, and just got trapped there. But luckily it was, a, you know, it was a big enough rock pool, it was fine. Um, and it just had to wait until the tide came in before it could swim off again. I'm extremely jealous. <laughs> I yeah. haven't really been there. I mean, I've seen cuttlefish, adult cuttlefish in the wild in the tropics, but I've never managed to see one in the UK, apart from those baby ones, which were amazing. They are. Very cool. Um, so we've got another question come in. Um, will you have volunteering opportunities with Sussex Wildlife Trust and the Wild Coast Sussex project? So yes, we will. Um, we'll have, I think, a number of different opportunities for people to get involved. Um, so I'll be running the Wild Beach sessions. So we'll be looking to help volunteer with those sessions. 
Um, and what else? Um, so we'll have, yeah, like Ella said, lots of different opportunities at sort of different levels. So you can be a Wild Coast Sussex supporter. Um, you can just come along on some beach cleans and volunteer some of your time to help uh, clean up the beaches. Um, we're going to try and get lots of young people volunteering with the project as well. Um, and there'll be, yeah, lots of different opportunities just to sort of bring different people's expertise to to help us so um any way that you want to help with the project then we'd, we'd love to hear from you so um at the moment we've just got a page on our sussex wildlife trust website um and in the making is a wild coast sussex website so watch this space um and yeah we'll have lots of opportunities coming up for you in the new year okay i think that is all of our questions that we've had in from everyone. Brilliant. So yeah, thank you for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed that and learned something. And yeah, keep your eyes peeled on our website for more information. Sign up to the uh, Shore Search mailing list. We also run um, Sea Search, which is a scuba diving survey. So if you're a certified scuba diver, you can get involved with that. You need to uh, be already qualified and but if you there's a also a mailing list to sign up for that so if you do that you will get some information for that and we should hopefully be starting to run beach cleans again when we can as well so there's loads of stuff that you can all get involved with